for a generation yet unborn. Yet today it's flipped. People are sacrificing our posterity for prosperity. We're adding a trillion dollars of debt every 100 days, and nobody cares, even though it's going to be left to our kids. So it's going to be a rude awakening for all those church members who think they're holy. We don't get involved when they realize by their silence they're giving consent to all that. They're becoming an accessory to it. They're inviting the judgment of God on their heads. But I think God is, we're getting close to the end times, and we're the bride of Christ. And I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. And I'm going to skip past some stuff just for the sake of time. And um, lots of good stuff I'll share tonight. And, um, but, uh, but we're the bride of Christ. And uh, every romance novel builds up to what? A decision-making moment. Right, you're watching the movie, and it's a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. And and I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment on purpose. Yeah. And so, I mean, think of it. Um, I'm going to be 67 years old in a month or so, and in my lifetime, I've never seen Satan clubs on elementary school campuses, Satan Disney FX having a Satan cartoon, um, Satan Grammys. Satan worshiping and trans Satanist clothes designers for Target, Satan statues in the Iowa State Capitol is like, like the Wizard of Oz and God's pulling back the curtains and letting you see behind all that curtain is, is Satan. All right? And people are being bolded for Jesus. And God's like, okay, romance novel, getting close to the end. I need you to make your decision. And some people are going to choose the all others. And others are going to say, I don't care about the all others. All I care about is Jesus. Yeah. And um, so, uh, so I uh, have a, a way to explain the gospel. So God's pushing us to what? A decision-making moment. And when you look out at all creation, what's unique about humans is we have a free will. We can make decisions for God or not God. And if you're God and you want to populate heaven, wouldn't you populate with people who want to be with you? So you have to give them the choice to make a decision to choose you or not choose you. So part of our lifetime is a choice, right? And so um, in 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Tiny spot, nothing there. When they developed the images, the size was the spot was the size of a grain of sand held between your ink fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Teeny spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that spot was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. This is not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And now with the James Webb telescope, you can see it even clearer and you can see the red shift. So light travels in waves with blue being the shortest wave and red being the longest wave. And so when you see the red shift, you're actually seeing these galaxies moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18. It's a super gas giant. It's so large, if you were to place Stevenson 2-18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We are the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all. And he made you. Why would he make you? What could you possibly offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing. Except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I can make everything. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love, by definition, must be voluntary. 
the moment it's forced, it evaporates. So in the context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he, he intentionally created one tiny thing. He does not control your will. <clears throat> now, he could control it if he wanted to. He's that powerful. But that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. And he doesn't need our love. He's not incomplete in our love, somehow complete. He doesn't need our love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But he'll never force you. Because the moment he would force you to love him, he himself would know he is forcing you to love him. And he would know your response is not a love response because he knew that he forced you to do it. So he'll never force you. You know, what's the most important thing in your life? Somewhere near the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. If you're made in God's image, could it be that loving and being loved is a big deal to God? Now, God loves everything he created. But the question is, could what he created love him back? Galaxies can't love. Rocks can't love. Animals follow instinct. I looked at the word angel in the King James Bible it appears 289 times. Not one time is the word love used to describe an angel's relationship with God. They worship God. They praise God. They glorify God. The word angel means messenger. They deliver God's messages. They deliver his judgments like in Egypt. They're heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. They sang when the stars were created. They rejoice when a sinner converts, but they are not made in the image of God. And Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They're mighty beings. They're incomprehensibly intelligent beings. But they're made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not powerful and we're not very smart. <laughs> you know, a king can have a castle with really powerful soldiers and really smart staff, and then he can have children. Guess what? The word love is used all throughout the Bible to describe men and women's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalms 91, because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings uniquely created with the ability to love God back. But for love to be love, it must be voluntary, so he'll never force us. There's a second thing. How can God give us free will to love him back, yet him still be in control of everything? God created light. Light is a photon, which is a perpendicular wave in the electromagnetic field that travels at 186,000 miles per second. And... Uh, so when God created the universe, he also created the electromagnetic field so light could travel across the universe. And Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you could travel approaching the speed of light, for you time would slow down. And if you could travel the speed of light, for you time would stand still. God created light, so he's faster than light, so for God time stands still. We'll never comprehend that, but there is a verse in the Bible that says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we are living in ultra slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever present now. I am that I am. When you are in God's presence, you cannot think about the past. You cannot think about the future. You can't even think. You just experience. I'm in the presence of all love, all beauty, all infinite, irresistible love, terrible judgment. And it's all at once. It would be totally overwhelming. So for God to create our reality, he had to create a little space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. He had to take now and stretch it out and slow it down. Why is this important? We get to make our little free will decisions, but we are moving so slow. He can readjust every electron and every quark and every neut neutrino, everything in the whole universe before he lets time move forward in the next nano frame. Right? 
So it's our limited free will in the context of his unlimited sovereign will. And it works because he's outside of time. You know, you have a GPS on your phone and you make a wrong turn, it recalculates. What if the guy in the car next to you is making a wrong turn at the same time and his is recalculating? What if everybody in the city is making wrong turns and it's all recalculating at the same time? What if everybody in the world, right? So we make good decisions. We make bad decisions. God's outside of time. He can readjust every electron before he lets time move forward to the next nanoframe. So his will is going to take place. And, um, and we sort of know this, that God is outside of time and that he arranges everything. Because if you're somewhere with somebody and you say, you know what? It's no coincidence that you and I are here together right now at this moment. This is not an accident. God planned this. This is providential. And you feel the goosebumps that, that God is there. And because God's outside of time, he can be ever present with each one of us all the time. And God has a perfect will for your life. And if you submit and walk in it, you walk in the perfect will. But sometimes we fudge, right? Some can follow, produce a harvest 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. There's the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God, right? You can decide how much you're going to submit to it. And then we can harden our heart and say, no. So, no, God, I'm not going to do it. And it's like God, Mordecai told Esther, okay, God will raise up somebody else to deliver Israel. If you're not going to do it, he'll find somebody else. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, God, I blew it. I, I should have obeyed you. Give me another chance. And guess what? He'll rearrange all the electrons to give you another chance. He'll buy back. He'll redeem, right? The word salvation comes from the word salvage. He can turn everything around. And so we get to make our little free will decisions, but he's outside of time. He's still in control of it, of everything. He's, nothing's going to happen unless he wants it to happen. The book of Revelation is going to take place exactly the way he said it was. So we are unique in that we're free will beings created to love God back. And he creates time. So we have our free will, but he's still in control. There's a third thing. He has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his universe creating omnipotent power, brighter than a trillion, trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. It would be instantaneous and involuntary. In the presence of all the power in the universe, boom, you'd be down. And God's like, I can do involuntary responses all eternity long. He is completely awesome. He's like, I I'm interested in this voluntary response. So he has to hide himself. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will's gone. And the same hiding of himself that allows us to have free will necessitates that we have faith. I mean, you need to thank God you don't know the future. Because if you knew the future, you wouldn't have to seek him. I know what's going to happen. You know, why, why? But we don't know the future, so we have to seek God. So I set it up so that we, because he wants us to seek him. So he creates us as free will beings. I was trying to think of a way of explaining why hiding his glory is necessary for our response to be love. Imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college and he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini. He's got his $40,000 Rolex watch. He's got gold rings, fancy clothes. He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside and drives up in a clunker, and he's got holes in his jeans. All the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library. And they eat together in the cafeteria. And they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then, then one day he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion estate. And the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. Right? And it says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. So God creates us as free will beings that can love him back. He creates time so we have our free will, but he's still in control. He hides himself so that we have the opportunity to use our free will. But there's a last thing. He's just and he cannot help it. 
which means he has to judge every sin. Because if he does not judge a sin, by default, his silence will be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. And he cannot deny himself. So he could never be loved back. Because if he creates free will beings, hides himself so we have free will, right, creates time. But if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge our sin, he's giving consent to our sin. If he gives consent to sin, he's denying himself. And he can't deny himself. So he could never be loved back. Until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created the first electron. And the plan was his own son would become a man. And as a man, he would take the judgment and die on the cross to pay for our sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? So God is just and that he judges every sin, but he's loving that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. And so um, you read the book of Revelation and you see the judgment being poured out. It's like God is the one pouring out the judgment. Why? He's a just God. He has to judge every sin. In that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment, the equivalent, poured out on his head. Jesus took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he was sweating. And since he's God, he experienced it as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. You know, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, it's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being, suffering for a limited period of time, is equal to all of us limited beings, suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. He's the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb. He took the wrath of God upon himself. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating God and not have to worry about being judged. Because all the judgment we deserve went on the Lamb, and we're approaching him through the Lamb. The Lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. Does that make sense? So God that created time arranged for you to be alive right now and you to be in this room and for you to hear of his love for you. So with that, I'm going to ask Pastor to come on up and we thank God for Jesus. Can you say thank God for Jesus? I thought the first thing I would talk about is Christian nationalism. Have you heard that term? It's the latest uh, boogeyman type term. But um, so nationalism is the opposite of globalism. And uh, there are people called globalists that want a one world government. And one of them is uh, Brock Chisholm. He was the first director of the World Health Organization. Have you heard of that organization? And Brock Chisholm said, to achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their national patriotism. So people that are globalists don't like people that want to preserve their nation. By the way, as we speak, the World Health Organization is working on a treaty to get all of the countries of the world to surrender their sovereignty to it. So when they declare another pandemic, they can get control over the, to lock down the whole world. And uh, Michelle Bachman, who's a former congressman from Minnesota, who is, um, was a presidential candidate years back. She's also on the board, uh, excuse me, uh, the head of the School of Government at Regent University. And so I'm on the board of trustees of Regent University. So I get to spend time with Michelle whenever I go there for, for meetings. But Michelle Bachman is the one who began to let everyone know that they're working on this World Health Organization treaty that has this little fine print that if they declare a pandemic that they'll, countries will surrender their sovereignty. So globalists. One is Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, Davos. They have these meetings of all the rich people. And um, 
And he said in his Agenda 2030 video that uh, by, you'll own nothing and be happy. Sounds a lot like Karl Marx, who said the theory of communism may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. Let's see, abolition of private property, that, that means you'll own nothing. <laughs> so globalists want world communism, right? And of course, they'll be at the top. And um, now, nationalism is the opposite of globalism, but nationalism also depends on the nation. And in socialist, communist nations, there are no individual rights, right? Nazi stands for National Socialist Workers' Party. They didn't guarantee individual rights, ask the Jews, right? The USSR stands for Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, right? They didn't care about individual rights. And in Islamist countries, and in some of the Middle Eastern ones where they have very fundamentalist people, uh, non-Muslims don't have individual rights. But in our country, we're dedicated to individual rights. And these rights are from a creator, which is important because the government doesn't give the rights. The government cannot take away the rights. The rights come from a source higher than the government called the creator. And these rights include freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom to a speedy trial by a jury of your peers, freedom to not have cruel and unusual punishment, and freedom to possess an arm to defend yourself and your family. And so these freedoms come from the creator. The government's job is to guarantee to you your creator-given rights, and to top it all off, it's government from the consent of the governed. You get to be in charge. So our nation is different than most other nations. And so wanting to preserve our nation is wanting to preserve the citizen being in control. And Lincoln's Gettysburg Address ends that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. And so nationalism is the opposite of globalism. National depends on the nation. And Christian nationalism used to be called Christian patriotism. I have a Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. The word nationalism is not in there. The word patriotism is patriotism, the char characteristic of a good citizen, the noblest passion that animates man, a character of a citizen, love of one's country, so forth. George Washington said to the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. So he saw no problem with being a patriot and a Christian. Lincoln, his inaugural address, he said intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on him are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty. He mentions patriotism and Christianity right next to each other in his inaugural. He saw no problem with that. He was a Republican, freed the slaves, right? Emancipation Proclamation, 13th Amendment. Well, the South had Democrats, right? Lincoln was the first Republican president. And in the South, they had Jim Crow laws and black codes and started the KKK. And so Ulysses S. Grant started the Department of Justice to stop these Democrats from their vigilante activities in the South. There's 13,000 pages of testimony of people being harassed by the, the Democrat Party in the South. And so uh, Ulysses S. Grant left the federal troops in the South to protect the blacks. It's called Reconstruction. And, uh, but they, they did lynchings. And so Tuskegee Institute, in Alabama did research and they documented over 4,700 lynchings. There were more than that, but these were documented. Did you know 1,200 of those lynchings were white Republicans down in the South registering the freed blacks to vote and they were lynched too. <laughs> and so the president of Tuskegee's Booker T. Washington and he was invited by Republican President Theodore Roosevelt to be an honored guest in the White House for dinner. First black man ever to have dinner in the White House. 
And Theodore Roosevelt said, the mob lynches the Negro. Every Christian patriot in America needs to lift up his voice in loud and eternal protest against the mob spirit. And so he uses Christian patriot, right? And then FDR during World War II, he was Episcopalian and he um, passed out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all, all the soldiers in World War II. Blue ones to the Navy, brown ones to the Army. He writes the foreword to it, right? He says, as commander in chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Could you imagine the president passing out New Testament and Book of Psalms? I wonder if the mainstream media would call Franklin Roosevelt a Christian nationalist, right? He's defending our nation against the Nazis, Imperial Japan, and he's a Christian passing out New Testaments. And he said, those forces hate democracy and Christianity as two phases of the same civilization. By the way, I did a book on FDR and uh, I read through every address while he was in office. Did you know he was in office 12 years? He got elected president four times. They passed the 22nd Amendment after him to limit a president to just two terms. So I read through all these addresses and I kept seeing all these references to Christianity. He says, those forces hate democracy and Christianity as two phases of the same civilization. They oppose democracy because it is Christian. They oppose Christianity because it preaches democracy. He said, the whole world is divided between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal. We choose human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. Now he met with Churchill and Churchill would talk about France has fallen, right? The, the, now the, the battle of Britain is about to begin. The fate of Western civilization now depends on the courage of, of this army. And, and he gives his famous speech. And, and then Eisenhower said, any group that awakens all of us is a dedicated patriotic group that can well take the Bible in one hand, the flag in the other, and march ahead. So Eisenhower had no problem with somebody having a Bible, somebody having a flag. Um, did you know that in 1965, 93% of Americans identified as Christian. 93% in 1965. That was 69% Protestant, 24% Catholic, and then 3% of the country was Jewish. So the country was l mostly Christian and they were patriotic. Nobody saw anything wrong with being a patriotic and being a Christian. And now the left engages in something called psychological projection, where they blame Christians for what they're doing, right? It's a narcissistic response mechanism. When somebody is caught doing something wrong, they accuse the person that caught them. Like little kids, I didn't start the fight, you did. Or a cheating spouse, when they're caught, they will accuse the faithful spouse of being unfaithful, right? And so it's in the Bible, Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of lusting after her when she was lusting after him. So lo and behold, it's the left that wants to set up a nationalism. It's a woke nationalism. It's a transgendered nationalism. And they're not very tolerant of your views. And if you don't give up your views, they want to get you fired. They want you to lose your job. They want to cancel you and so forth. So they're the ones that are intolerant. And um, I brought out this morning, but Christians don't want dominionism. They want freedomism. <laughs> We don't want anybody to force any views on anybody else. We just don't want the government forcing the government views on us and on our children. Um, now, why does the mainstream media always call pro-life people anti-abortion? There's no pro-life group that calls itself anti-abortion. They call themselves pro-life, but every single mainstream news article will always call pro-life people anti-abortion. Why do they do that? Negative word association. They, that anti-word makes a negative impression in our brain. Why do they call pro-life or, or a patriots nationalists? Negative word association, right? It's a, it's a boogeyman type of thing. And this is interesting. It's an article, follow the money to the after party. Rockefeller bankrolling after party Bible studies is red flag in the same grant round as a group seeking to promote leadership of rural, rural LGBTQ people. In other words, the Rockefellers are, are globalists. The, all these globalists, they want to give money to woke seminaries 
So they'll teach Christians not to get involved in politics, while at the same time they're giving money to their LGBTQ activists to get them involved in politics. What a brilliant strategy, <laughs> right? Silence your opposition and give money to your supporters. And um, now, one of the things that I have brought out in my talk this morning is that the most common form of government in world history is kings, right? Or it's basically a king is a glorified gang leader and they go by different names. Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar, Maharaja, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, until then these kingdoms keep getting bigger and bigger because with the latest military advancements, kings can kill more people. And, uh, and so they, you know, Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, and, and then um, uh, finally the King of England had the biggest empire on the planet. And, uh, and so democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of the king and give it to the people. Now what's the difference between a democracy and a republic? So democracy has two meanings. One meaning is a general reference to a popular government. Popular meaning the population participates in ruling themselves. And in Harry S. Truman's inaugural address, he goes through like a, almost a dozen points comparing democracy versus communism. In democracy, we believe in freedom of speech. In communism, they don't, and, right? And so that's a general use of the word democracy. But as a literal form of government, it only worked on a small scale, like a Greek city-state where there were 6,000 citizens because every citizen had to be at every meeting every day to talk about every issue. I mean, it was totally time consuming. You did not have time for anything else. And if you showed up late and you're, you're going to ask, what are we talking about today? If you don't know what they're talking about, they have a name for you. It's called idiotus. <laughs> oh, he's an idiot. <laughs> right? But it, it couldn't, could not grow any bigger than a city. And you had to be there every day. A republic could get bigger because you would have somebody in your place that goes to the market every day. So you could do other stuff, your family, your farm, your business, right? So an easy way to remember is the word republic begins with three letters, R-E-P, and the word representative begins with three letters, R-E-P. So a republican form of government is a representative form of government. You're still the king, you're just delegating the job to go there and talk about politics to somebody that's gonna look out for your interest. Well, if democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of a king and give it to the people, what if the king wants the power back? Does he just ask for it? Hi, I want to be king. Give me control of your life. Well, people aren't in a hurry to give up that. So there's two methods in which the king can get the power back. One is fear. If you get the population into fear, they will panic and be willing to trade their freedom for security. And the other's free stuff. The government's so nice, it's giving you free stuff until you get hooked. And then you want some more free stuff, you're gonna incrementally give up your freedom to keep it coming. So it's like a drug dealer takes over a neighborhood two ways. He can come in with guns and get everybody into fear and they submit to the mob and pay extortion protection money. Or the drug dealer is so nice, he's giving away free drugs until you get hooked. And then you want some more free drugs? Well, you're going to have to give up your freedom, give up, you sell yourself into prostitution if need be. It's sort of like a hunter catches animals through guns or bait. All right, there's a front door, there's a back door. And um, I was reading How to Catch Pigs in the Wild. In Texas, they have a lot of these wild pigs, and they can tear up a cornfield in one night. Do you have those in Missouri? Right? And, um, but this article said... Um, you put a post in the ground and throw some corn down. The pigs come, eat the corn, and ignore the post. The next day, you put two posts in the ground, throw the corn down. Next day, three posts and four posts, and you start putting them in like a semicircle. And the pigs get keep, they eat in the corn, they ignore. Then you got a, almost a complete circle with a little opening, and the pigs show up. They squeeze through the opening, they're eating the corn, and you shut the gate, and you caught yourself some wild pigs. And so you get a population into dependency. 
right? They'll give you free money for this, free money for that. I was in one place, and, and I didn't think of it, but they said, yeah, be careful. If the, if the homeschoolers start taking free money, it'll be fine at first, but then they're going to start saying, okay, you got to register. you got to sh- tell us what you're teaching. we got to let us inspect. I don't know. They're going to – who knows? Um, so um, some scriptures. Fear of man bringeth a snare. So when you feel yourself making decisions out of fear, there's a chance that you're going to be trapped. That's why the Bible says, fear not, fear not, over and over again, fear not. So if you're in a scary situation, you, you go before the Lord and pray until you get a peace in your heart, and then you make a decision out of peace. Um, and then free stuff. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And that was like what Eve saw, that, that apple looked good to the flesh and good to the eyes and the pride of life. And so let's talk about fear. How do you create an, an atmosphere of fear? You have to sow discord. I mean, everything's fine. Why be afraid? Everything's fine. But if there's a discord, if there's an unsettledness, if there's an insecurity, and so um, it produces this, uh, this fear. Now, a scripture, 